What do you think the Colts' biggest weakness is as a team? Is it the secondary or perhaps the wide receiver core? For me, this is a pretty simple answer. It's actually a position group within a position group. You've got the D-line, and I think within the D-line, the defensive tackles are just not playoff caliber. They're not good enough right now. I think that's the place we need to really improve. I think you've got a guy like Autry that's a solid player, but I think Al Woods is more of a backup. Grover Stewart more of a backup. I think Tyquan Lewis might be more of an end than a three-tech. So, I mean, they're going to use him there pass rushing downs and whatnot but as far as a base defense we've got to get better in the middle we we just need to get more push from the from the defensive tackles and just a more consistent I think it would lead to a more consistent defensive line overall I think that's where the inconsistency has come from the lack of push from the middle with the D tackles so for me I think that's the biggest spot on the defense where we need to improve the talent level and I'm sure we will yeah we always talk about building from the inside out and when you talk about the secondary or the wide receivers, like stated in the question, the wide receivers right now are getting extra time to create separation because of the guys up front offensively with the offensive line giving luck all the time in the world to throw. The secondary right now looks a little bit weaker because there's no push up front and we're not getting pressure on the quarterback. Last week, of course, we did against the Titans, and we saw how much better the secondary looked. So it's really one hand washes the other. And right now the offense is clicking on all cylinders from the offensive line to the backs are doing a decent job to the tight ends who are having an incredible season top to bottom. And then obviously Andrew Luck, I believe he's playing at an all-pro level. So it makes the receivers' jobs a little bit easier. T.Y. had a breakout game this week, 155 yards, nine catches, two touchdowns. The addition of Inman, he's jumped in. He's played really well. So the receivers have definitely been playing better over the last couple weeks. And the secondary, they're not great, but again, up front there's no push. When we get a push, like in the Bill game we got a push, In the Titan game this weekend, we got a push, and the secondary looked a lot better, creating turnovers, not giving up big chunk plays down the field. But in the Raider game, when we were getting absolutely no pressure on the quarterback, and in the Jaguar game up until the late part of the fourth quarter when we were getting no pressure on the quarterback, the secondary didn't look that good. Yeah, it's just it's a philosophy thing with me as far as you really want to build from the inside out. You want to be strong up the middle, meaning you want to have – a good defensive tackles, good middle linebacker, and a, and a really good strong safety to, to be able to come up and support the run. I think we have two of those things right now, but I just think we're missing that really big physical inside guy to really push the pocket and get after people. And I think, like Luke said, man, it's, it's a chain reaction with all this stuff. When you've got a really good D line, you can have an average secondary and an average linebacking core because the quarterback's not going to have time to throw the ball. Jason, before we move on to question number two, I don't know if you saw this this morning. I just want to touch on this a little bit. Jeff Saturday had a quote. I think this was in the Indy Star this morning. We walked into the locker room pregame on Sunday, and I told Coach Frank Reich and Chris Ballard, this feels like home. This is the locker room I'm used to, and there's an expectation that they're going to win, end quote. And that's just kind of something we talked about really last year in January, February, over the winter when the Colts hired Frank Reich, we said now, because Ballard was already here for a year, but now that Pagano's gone, Frank Reich's in here, and the coach is really the more day-to-day, the locker room kind of guy. So now that we have this head coach and GM duo together, Chris Ballard and Frank Reich, they're going to change the culture. And that was one of the reasons why we felt like the name of this show was so appropriately named, because we were trying to change the culture at the end of the Ryan Griggs and Chuck Pagano era. We were trying to get them out, and we needed a culture change, because there was a toxic atmosphere and a toxic environment in 2015-16 and then even a little bit last year last year the changing of the guard began because Ballard came in but it wasn't a complete full effect change because the coach from the previous regime was still here and we talked about this all winter the culture was going to change because now we have the right head coach in place and we have the right general manager in place and for Jeff Saturday to come out and publicly say that, almost as if the last time I was in this locker room, it did not feel like home, and now it does feel like home. And I went up to Coach Frank Reich, and I went up to Chris Ballard, and I told them I feel at home again. And I'm pretty sure Jeff Saturday is not the only guy that felt like that. I'm sure Payton felt like that, Marvin felt like that, Edge felt like that, so on and so forth. Yeah, and one thing I'd point out, I would like to point out about that is Frank Reich is one of us. He's a Colt. I mean, he played for the Bills, but he started his coaching career in Indianapolis, and he was there with all those guys, I think, except maybe Edge. So he knows all, all those guys. He knows what it means to be a Colt. He knows what it means to be part of this organization. So 
I'm sure he respected what Saturday said, and he has the same expectation as all of those players do. This is going to be a winning organization. They expect to win every week, and they're going to go out there and put their best foot forward every week. It's not going to be a bunch of talk. It's going to be a bunch of walks. So, I mean, that's a great quote, and I think it's something that Frank Reich really, really believes in. I think he expects to win. I don't think there's any excuses with this guy. And uh, I think we got the right guy, man. I've said that a a million times, and I'm thankful McDaniels didn't take the job. And and listen, it's going to be a fun, fun run with Frank Reich running this team. Let's say the Colts are a mid-round team in the 2019 draft. Who could you possibly look at in regards to what this team needs and who would fit what Chris Ballard and Frank Reich want? We need help in the middle, So and and this is a really good draft for defensive tackles. I mean, there's a lot of guys I like. That would probably be my guess. But then there's other guys like the linebacker from LSU that's really good. I mean, I think we need another linebacker. We obviously need a receiver. I like Kelvin Harmon a lot from NC State. Not in the mid-round of the first, but, I mean, later in the draft, obviously. Listen, it's very early. We have needs. I think we have a need at corner. We have a need at defensive tackle. We have a need at linebacker, probably – uh, edge rusher because you can never have too many of those but again the draft is after free agency we have to see what happens during free agency before we even guessing about draft at this point is hard but then you throw in the fact that it's after free agency so there might be certain positions that we're good at that we don't have the talent at now that we'll have filled like say just for instance if we sign demarcus lawrence or jj van Clowney for a defensive end spot then obviously we're not going to take an edge player early but if we don't it's possible you know you always want to take the best player available you don't just want to take a need guy so we'll see what happens but for me personally I really think we need a D tackle I don't think there's anything out there as far as free agency wise that I'd be willing to spend money on for a D tackle so I would be looking at Rashawn Gary guys like that in the middle of the first although you just again combine numbers all that stuff you don't know who's going to be available but there are a lot of d tackles available in this draft and i definitely think the colts need to get one early because that's a spot where i think they can really really improve on their defense to make it better do you think strong safety landing collins is worth a big free agent deal in indy since safeties are cheaper than corners the one problem with this question is i think he gets franchise tagged in new york so i don't think he hits the market yeah, that's a good point. I wasn't even uh, – these are things I never consider, which is stupid of me since I'm in, kind of in the business of considering these things. But, <laughs> you know, if we were able to sign him, I would absolutely go after him. But like Luke said, I mean, the franchise tag is there. He's in a situation where he's kind of stuck. So I'm not sure what we're going to do at Strong Safety. I really feel like we have to do something, though. We've either got to draft a guy or because – Listen, I love Clayton Gathers, but his career is, is much closer to the end than it is to the beginning. So, And, and he's only been in the league a couple of years, so we've got to really look at upgrading there. And if Landon Collins isn't there, I'm sure there's other guys. We really need to look at trying to find a guy that can stay on the field. And I know that's easier said than done when you're talking about a position like strong safety where you're up there making big hits and and you're constantly in collisions and and stuff like that. So it's going to be hard to find a guy that's durable, but we've got to do better than what we've been doing. I mean, we've Clayton Gathers has been injured so much since he's been here. We really need to uh, really look into, A, finding maybe a guy in the draft or maybe signing a free agent, maybe a stopgap guy to get to another draft. Who knows? I don't know what we're going to do there. But we definitely need to do something because maybe build the depths. We could re-sign Gathers to an incentive contract maybe and then build the depth behind them. Experts say the 2019 quarterback draft class is very weak. Do you think the Colts will part ways with Jacoby Brissett and trade him this upcoming offseason? That's actually not a bad question. I know they really like him. So unless somebody offers them something insane like a first or second round pick, Maybe not a second round pick. If somebody offers them a first round pick, they would trade him, I think. But yeah. they really like him a lot, man. I, I don't see them doing that and creating an issue where they don't really need an issue. You know what I mean? Like yeah, they, yeah. they have their backup quarterback. That's like you know, you make the trade, you get the draft capital, but at the same time, now you're creating a hole, you don't know what you're getting. Like you could go out and sign a scrub backup quarterback, but then you're not gonna win any games if Andrew Luck 
misses a couple of games or whatever, you're going to lose those games. So I personally would, would just stick with what's working. I wouldn't consider it maybe until Brissett's on his last is, – is he on his last year ne- this year or next year? I'm not sure. Yeah, see, I don't have that in front of me. I might consider it when he's on his last year of his contract. Maybe. Yeah, what Jacoby Brissett, what I keep telling people is we're not trading him as a backup. And what I mean by that is this offseason when the Seahawks wanted to trade for Brissett, they were trading for him as a backup. So he would have went from Indy as a backup to Luck to Seattle as a backup for – Wilson, that's not going to happen because anybody who values Jacoby Brissett as a backup quarterback cannot possibly value him higher than we value him as a backup quarterback because he's already in our system. We're comfortable with him. The coaches are comfortable with him. Him and Luck get along. There's no reason for us to trade Brissett to another team to be their backup, and nobody's giving up a first-round pick for a backup quarterback. I was just going to say, I just looked at this, and I looked it up while you got, while you were talking, Luke, and he is a... He is a free agent in 2020, so 2019 will be his last year as a Colt. So, it does change everything. My whole theory, though, my philosophy still kind of stands true because if a team is trading for him as a backup on the last year of his contract, what are they going to give up? So, I still would not trade him to a team that values him as a backup quarterback. The only way I trade him is if a team values him as a starter. If the Giants want to get rid of Eli and they don't like a quarterback in the top 10 this year and they want Brissett to be their starter next year and they value him as a second round pick and that second round pick is a top 10 pick in the second round, I would do it in a heartbeat. I would probably even do it for a third now knowing that he's going to be a free agent after this year. Well, after ne- it's after next year. After next yeah. year, yeah. Well, after this yeah. year, I mean, we would have traded him at the deadline most likely. Right. And there would be no right, trade right. value for him. But If I'm not getting any – look, I'm not giving him away. And honestly, if Jacoby Brissett was willing to re-sign in Indianapolis to back up Andrew Luck for a – reasonable contract, which I don't know the guy. He seems like a great teammate. I would actually be into that, too, because we haven't had a legitimate backup quarterback here for many, many years. So that's something I would look into. And that's just me because I believe in, like, you don't want your team to basically go down the toilet if you lose your starting quarterback. So having him there is like having a security blanket for luck. And so if luck is, like, dinged up and you're like, man, I don't know, he's 50-50, you can err on the side of caution and play Brissett because you know you have a chance to win with him. Mm-hmm. So I would trade him if they get offered really good compensation for him, but I'm not just giving him away. Like yeah, he, no, no, no. He could play in this offense. He could win in this offense, I have no doubt. So, you know, we'll see what happens. I would definitely consider it for first, second, third round maybe, but not anything lower than that. Yeah, that's a great point, Jason. I wasn't even thinking about that, like the whole bringing him back thing. You let him test the market and see if anybody out there wants to make him a starting quarterback. But if nobody bites and he's going to sign a contract somewhere as a backup, it better be an indie, especially if it's a very reasonable contract. And I would make him one of the higher paid backup quarterbacks in the league. I wouldn't have a problem with that at all. And no coach in the NFL right now, this is probably opinion-based, but I think it could be a fact, no coach in the NFL right now values a backup quarterback more than Frank Reich. He was a backup quarterback and he won a Super Bowl last year as an offensive coordinator with a backup quarterback. You can't tell me one of the other 31 guys except maybe Peterson in Philadelphia values a backup quarterback more than Frank Reich. So if Frank Reich went up to Chris Ballard and said, listen, it's worth giving him an extra million or an extra two million to sign him as a backup quarterback, I think the Colts could make it work. And I can totally see Ballard extending him. And the reason why is Ballard always talks about how much he, he values guys that come into the system. Now, he wasn't a Colt originally, but he came into the, to the system at the same time Ballard did, basically, six months later, really, and becomes a Colt, becomes a leader, becomes a good teammate. He's valued in the locker room. And we've got all this money to sign our own guy. And that's another thing. We're not going to sign a lot of free agents. That's never going to happen. He wants to grow his own and re-sign his own. So it gives guys the motivation to play well, knowing they'll get paid and be able to stay in Indianapolis. And I think having a guy like Jacoby Brissett who probably won't break the bank as their backup quarterback is, like I said, it's a safety net. And I think he values that. I think both of them, I think Ballard and especially Reich, value that backup quarterback position. And I wouldn't be surprised if he gets extended, honestly, before he even gets to free agency because from everything I've seen, Brissett loves it here. So Mm -hmm. we'll see what happens. I know he wants to start. Everyone wants to start. But – it's an interesting question, a very good question by 
one of our listeners. I, it's one that you could really think about and talk about for a long time, as we've proven. <laughs> yes, we did. <laughs> Does Braden Smith stay at right tackle in 2019 or move back to right guard? Thoughts? My thoughts are, yeah, if it ain't a, broke, don't fix it. So if he's playing good football at right tackle, personally, I keep him at right tackle. I keep it the way it is right now. If these five guys are healthy, there's no reason to move anything around. I would keep these five guys the way it is moving into 2019. Add depth behind them, but I would not change anything as far as these five. Even Glowinski, I would not change anything right now, especially position flexing and moving guys around. I wouldn't think about flirting with the idea of moving him back to right guard. I agree to an extent. My only caveat to what Luke said is if there's two really, really good NFL left tackle type players in this draft coming up, and if the Colts are looking at, okay, Costanzo is in you know year nine or coming up on year eight or whatever, and they want to draft a, a left tackle or whatever and, and then maybe move Costanzo or maybe just play that guy that they draft at right tackle and move Braden to his natural position – I wouldn't have a problem with that because you've got to always constantly look out for your quarterback. And if there's an elite talent on the O-line that's there, it drops or whatever, because I don't honestly, offensive tackles that are really good don't last long. And if we're, we're probably going to be picking in the mid-round. He pro- unless they drop, I would stick with what's working. But, if, dude, if he drop, I mean, look at Malik Hooker. He dropped to us. I never thought that would happen. So you never know. But unless that happens where the kid from Alabama drops or – or whatever the you know then then you're just going to stick with what you're you know with what's working which is what we're doing right now so i agree with what luke said if it ain't broke don't fix it unless unless there's an elite offensive tackle there i believe ballard envisions a defense like the 2005 to 12 bears what do you think the most important missing piece is compared to that bears defense that's a good question. I'm going to stick with what I've been saying all along. I feel like the game is won on the line of scrimmage, and I feel like we're set literally at every position on offensive line and on defensive line except for the defensive tackle position. I think we really need a guy that can get in there and just push the pocket. I was hoping that we would draft Maurice Hurst out of Michigan this last year. It didn't work out, but I think there's a lot of guys in this draft, as I've stated, the kid from Mississippi State, Simmons, you know, Rashawn Gary, there's guys that are going to be good defensive tackles in this draft, a lot of good defensive line players. So Clemson themselves have four that are coming out that are all really good players. There's going to be guys there. For me, it's the defensive tackle position. It hasn't changed. I think that's, like I've said, you build that defense with strength up the middle. You need a great middle linebacker. We've got that. You need a great strong safety. We probably need to get that and also a defensive tackle. I think you start with a defensive tackle because you went on the line of scrimmage. Coming off a great performance against Tennessee, where does the Colts' defense go from here, and what position do you think they need to draft in the upcoming draft? (laughs) Well, I've covered the draft. It's definitely (laughs) defensive tackle. For me, that's the position. We have needs, okay? We all know we have a wide receiver need. I'm not sure if there's a defensive tackle there and a wide receiver there, I'm taking the defensive tackle. That's just me because I believe in building from the inside out. So that's... That's the answer to that question for me. What do we need to do? We need to keep getting pressure on the quarterback. Tannehill's coming back. It's the same deal. We've got to get after him. Can't let him sit back there and pick us apart. If we get pressure on him, you know, and I'm not even saying sacks, just QB hits, hurries, get him off his spot, we'll win the game. If we don't, it's going to be a tough game. So, to me, it's the same keys every week. Turnovers, don't turn the ball over. Keep our quarterback clean. Get to their quarterback. It's the same this week. That's what I think we need to do. Just keep the pressure on. Keep bringing exotic blitzes. Keep designing, you know, different schemes, defensive looks for Tannehill, especially since he hasn't played in a while. You can probably confuse him a little bit. I think I would do a little bit of that. Just stick to what works, man. We've been we've been playing well. The last game was really really solid performance. We were really good in the first half of the Jacksonville game. We really just need to stay consistent. So. Do I expect them to give up you know, only 10 points? Probably not, but just consistent pressure on the quarterback is probably the key to the game for me. Yeah, like Jason always says, the keys to the game every week are pretty much the same. And the pressure thing is something that I find, because when I look at this Colts offensive line and how they've played the last five weeks, the no sacks is incredible. But when you look at the last three weeks, they've only given up three QB hits. To me, that's more impressive than anything. A sack is a QB hit and a knockdown and a sack. 
So when you look at last week, not only did they have zero sacks, they had zero QB hits, which is very impressive because you could have a game. What would you rather have? Would you rather have zero sacks, 10 QB hits, and five QB knockdowns, or would you rather have one sack, one hit, one knockdown? Because a sack is a knockdown and a hit. So I want to get as much pressure on the quarterback as possible, and I want to take as much pressure off my quarterback as possible. It's not always about sacks, like Jason always says. And I want to just get that push. Tannehill's sneaky athletic, but he hasn't played in a couple weeks, so you want to get him uncomfortable. You want to get him off his mark. You want to make him move around a little bit. And I think the Colts' defense has the capability to do it in back-to-back weeks. The last time they had a great defensive performance was against Buffalo. The next week they came out, and they did not have a very good defensive performance against the Oakland Raiders, giving up 28 points, letting Carr pretty much do whatever he wanted with all the time in the world to throw. And then when we did get back there, we weren't able to get a hand on him, and he was ducking and dodging and missing guys. Tannehill is a good athlete. He doesn't get nearly enough credit for that. I believe he was a wide receiver in college before he became a quarterback, and it's usually the other way around. So he is a good athlete. He can move. He doesn't get enough credit for that. So we got to get him uncomfortable, got to get him off his mark. And if we do that and we're able to – hold on to the ball, create some turnovers, I think we should be able to go out there and win this game against Miami. Yeah, just to expand on my answer a little bit, just knowing his injury, he had a shoulder injury, my game plan personally would be to press the receivers, get up in their face, and really make him make quick decisions with the pass rush and also try to get him to throw the ball downfield. He's coming off a shoulder injury. His arm strength is not going to be – at its at its peak so he's probably not gonna be able to make every throw and he's probably gonna be rusty he hasn't played since October 7th so he's gonna be rusty you know I would bring blitzes I would mix the defense up I would play my receivers with my corners pressed up on them to make them you know have to work to get off the line of scrimmage and limit the amount of time he has so that's what I would do I think the Colts would probably do something similar to that just because obviously Iberflus is a really smart guy He's not going to make it easy on, on – I would think he would make it as hard as possible on Tannehill. And I think, you know, a guy's coming off a shoulder injury, he hasn't played in a month. I'm kind of glad he's coming back this week because if you guys know anything about Brock Osweiler. He's had some success against us. So I'm actually glad Tannehill's playing. It'll be an interesting game. I hope the guys can build on their defensive performance from the Tennessee game because that was really, really inspiring and, and really promising, and hopefully they can pick up where they left off this week. Do you think Matt Eberflus will be a good head coach if and when he becomes one? Wow, uh, that's a real early question <laughs> as far as, like, uh, I, th- I don't think we're even really close to that point yet. It's also hard to predict uh, that because there's been some great coordinators that have been great coordinators for four, five, six years. Pretty much every guy on Belichick's coaching tray, they're all great coordinators, but then they don't become good head coaches. And he's only been a coordinator now for 10 games, so he hasn't yeah. even been a coordinator it- for two, three, four years. So it's tough to answer. It's tough to predict that because you have great coordinators that for some reason, I mean, look at Tom Moore. Tom Moore, you can make an argument he's a Hall of Fame offensive coordinator. He never even became a head coach. Yeah, I agree. Uh, Do I think he has the traits that a good head coach needs, communication, ability to connect with players? Yeah, I think he's got all that. But listen, until you're put in that position – it's a whole other animal. You know what I mean? You can be – I mean, he's been a coordinator for 10 games, like Luke said. But being a head coach is a totally different animal than being a coordinator. You're overseeing the entire situation. So the traits that I see from him tend to make me think he would be a good coach because he's got – like McDaniels is a terrible communicator. You know he's not going to be a very good head coach. This guy is a really good communicator. He's a very good motivator. He connects with his players. He's able to get them to do take what they do on the practice field to the actual game field. But, again, it's way too early to say anything one way or the other. I'm going to have to see at least two years of this guy before I can ever make a really legitimate prediction on one way or the other how he would do. But I do think he's got what it takes at some point to be a candidate for a head coaching job. Do I think he'll get one down the road? It's possible, but it's way too early to say. Do you think losing Ryan Kelly for a few games will hurt our running game? Well, it's not going to help. First of all, let's cross our fingers. It's not for the rest of the season because we still don't really know anything. They said it's probably going to be a week-to-week thing. But as far as Evan Beam, the guy that's coming into play for Ryan Kelly, I think he'll be okay because he's got Quentin Nelson on one side and Golinski on the other side. And I think those guys will really help him. 
the key for a center, though, is communication with the other linemen. I definitely, you're losing something, obviously, as far as blocking goes. You're talking about an all-pro caliber player, and you're talking about a backup center that we just signed four weeks ago. So you're going to lose something. But do I think it's just going to destroy the O-line and we're going to become terrible? No. I, I, I just think they'll adapt. Reich will adapt the offense. He'll adapt to the player, and he'll make it work. I don't think it's going to be... I hope it's not going to be as big a loss as it seems to be on paper. We'll see. I mean, we just got to see how it goes. I do think having those those really solid guys next to him will will help him uh, kind of mitigate the situation because if it was in the past where you got like I don't know Mike McGlynn on one side and and Seth Olson on the other side, yeah, it would be a disaster. But the line would already be a disaster, so because those other two guys would be on it. So I think we'll be all right. Do you think RG3 would make a quality backup for luck in 2019 and beyond? It would be quite interesting to have the number one and number two draft picks from the same draft on the same team. I would only do it if we could find Trent Richardson because then it would be very interesting to have the number one, number two, and number three picks from the same draft on the same team. Could you imagine Trent Richardson behind this offensive line? The memes we would have with the gaping holes that he would not be hitting because he was legally blind? Oh, God. (laughs) <laughs> Can we never mention him again, please? The next question, ironically, is actually about Trent Richardson. Ugh. Do you think the Colts should sign? No, I'm just kidding. Do you think the lack of Ebron? T- <laughs> Do you think the that lack? Was funny, Luke. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Do you think the lack of yeah, Ebron targets Sunday was designed that way? I don't think it was necessarily designed. I think it was the way the Titans played Ebron was the reason why they played him with a DB. So most people play Ebron with a linebacker. They went into the game. I think they had a game plan knowing or thinking something that Pagano would never do before a game (laughs) that the Titans would use a DB to cover Ebron because the Titans have secondary depth. They've got Baird back there. They've got a Dory Jackson. They've got a lot of Logan Ryan, Malcolm, you know, they got all those guys. So, what the Colts were thinking and what they ended up doing was they're going to put a DB on Ebron. They figured that's what their game plan is going to be to take him away. And so, therefore, T.Y. is going to show out. And that's exactly what happened. If they would have played Ebron with a linebacker, I think Ebron would have had another good game. But they didn't. They played him with a DB, which I think you're going to see a lot of other teams try to do. And that's fine because Reich will scheme you right back. He'll scheme – He'll scheme T.Y. Hilton into the offense. He'll scheme Ryan Grant into the offense. He'll scheme our running backs. It doesn't matter. You take away Ebron, somebody else is going to light you up. So do I think it was necessarily a planned decoy situation? No. I think they knew what the Titans were going to try to do going into the game, and they knew T.Y. Hilton was going to be in one-on-one coverage against a Dory Jackson. I mean, I love a Dory Jackson, but he's not covering T.Y. Hilton one-on-one. Not many people can. And he's one of those many people that can't as we saw this right. weekend with T.Y. lighting them up. Do you think the Colts are due for a uniform and logo update, or do you prefer the current classic look? Oh, this is easy for me. I'm old school. I'm old and old school. I love the classic look. I, I like the classic look of the Colts. I like the Raiders' classic look. I like the Steelers' classic look as much as I hate them. I like the Bears. Like I'm all about classic. So, And I think the Colts have one of the best uniforms in all of sports, not just the NFL. It's just a classic uniform. I might mix in, like, you got you guys remember, I think it was Philadelphia in 2010, we wore, like, the 1954 uniforms. Yeah, with, with the, the blue green. helmet. Yeah, with the blue helmet. Yeah, like, yeah, I, I don't fine. mind that, like, mixing that in. But as the base uniform, I love our uniforms. Yeah, I was looking at our analytics this weekend, which I wish I didn't do, because in the last 28 days, our viewership is 99.9% male and 0.1% female, which I then realized... <laughs> If you want to land chicks, do not start a Colts podcast because it's not going to work. Not that that was our intent. Yo, Jason, let's start a Colts podcast. We'll get mad bitches. But, you know, we started this podcast to talk Colts football, and it ended up turning into a male, not to say we don't welcome females, too. We do, of course. We try to cater to everybody. We're just talking Colts football. It is what it is. For some reason, we seem to attract. Maybe it's because we're so friggin' ugly. We just seem to attract all males, but we got 99.9% males. 
The reason I bring this up is because I was also looking at the age demographic. A lot of 18 to 24 year olds, which is right where I fall at 23. Then we have a lot of 25 to 34 year olds. So a majority of our listeners are 18 to 34. And it makes sense that our listeners would want new cool uniforms. It's just, I mean, it just makes sense. That's just human nature. The younger kids are going to want the new look. And personally, as a 23-year-old, I actually am a fan. It's probably because I was brainwashed by my dad. I'm a fan of the classic look. I think the Colts have some of the best uniforms in football. I like the classic look. I would not want to change it. Maybe you could go with the color rush like we're going to use this weekend, blue on blue, blue pants, blue jersey. Maybe you could go with that a couple times a year here and there, bring back the blue helmets. This weekend, I think they should wear the blue helmets with the blue pants and just go all blue and just do a complete blue out with the two little horseshoes on the back of the helmet. I think that would be pretty cool. They I'm a like, traditionalist. They look like Teletubbies, man. Come on. <laughs> I, <laughs> all blue. I, would, I would think about it. I would think about it. The blue helmet, uh, I like the blue helmets. I think they're cool, but I wouldn't want to wear it all the time. I would have to just wear I, it once a year. Luke, I think the blue helmet looks great with all white. But You're right. I don't think it all would right. look good. Well, I would do that then. I would do that. I would bring back the, the whole point is I would bring back the blue helmets once a year because I think the blue helmet looks really cool. But I like the blue yeah. helmet on the white uniform too. You're right. With the three stripes on the sleeve, I like that look. Yeah. I think that would look good yeah. if they brought that back. I would do the color rush once a year. So then you do 14 games traditional, and then you do two games. You do one home game, one road game. With the you do the you do the all blue the one game and then you do the all white with the blue helmet the one game and I think that would look really cool, but for the base uniform I'm a fan of traditional I like to go traditional it's just the way I am the way I was raised I like the traditional look, even though the Packers uniforms I think are ugly if they were to update it with the current color scheme I think it would look bad because then it would be like they're already ugly but they're ugly. And they've been ugly for 80 years, so it works. If it's ugly and then they update it, I think it's only going to look uglier. I'm not a fan of, like, the Seahawks with the neon green and Oregon with all their ridiculous uniforms. And the NBA breaks out a new uniform, like, every week. Like, I'm sure they're going to have Thanksgiving turkey-themed uniforms this week. (laughs) Then during Christmas, they got, like, the script lettering and they got the Christmas jerseys so they could sell them on Christmas Day. St. Patrick's Day, like yeah. they were, the Knicks wear green every year on things. St. Patrick's Day. I mean, it's ridiculous. There's just too many jerseys in the NBA. Baseball, they did the nicknames on the back of the jerseys. In the NBA, they did the all, nicknames. It's, all that all stuff about, is just. Luke, Luke, it's all about money. It's all about money. It's all about money. Yeah. Let's sell as many uniforms as possible. The Miami Heat, I watched like three seconds of the Heat Nets game last night. They had these black uniforms with like pink and blue lettering. I'm like, that's not the Miami oh, yeah. Heat. They looked like cotton candy. I mean, I was like, no, what do they do? They changed the floor. I was like, wow. They figured that we're going to make so much money off these uniforms that we could redo the floor for tonight's game and we'll still turn a profit because we're going to sell so many uniforms because everybody wants that Dwayne Wade and that white side black jersey with the pink lettering and the blue numbers. It's script. And it looked really cool, but that's not the Miami Heat. The Miami Heat, you got the block lettering, you got the yellow, you got the red, you got the the heat flame coming off the tee. Like, that's the heat. Last night what I right. saw was not the heat. So, to me, I'm a traditional guy. I like the traditional stuff, but I'm not surprised at all that our viewership <laughs> disagrees not because the... 18 to 24 year old guys they want something cool something fresh they want something different but you change the uniform you change the uniform one thing i would not change is the logo i think the colts horseshoe is perfect i think everything about it's perfect and if they were to like do like a full rebranding and change the logo i would be upset i would not it'll, like a logo change but we're not going to get never, that. it will it will never happen under ursay he loves that thing he loves the horseshoe i love the horseshoe I would literally lose my mind if they change, if they rebranded their entire. Oh my God! Let's 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 just move on. Let's not even <laughs> talk about that. The ninety nine point nine percent guys want us to move on, so we're going to move on. Name three notable free agents you'd like to see Ballard add next season. For me, it's Grady Jarrett, defensive tackle; Darrell Williams, offensive tackle; and Landon Collins, strong safety. I haven't really dug into free agency that much, but for me, there's two positions and three guys, and two of them I would like us to sign. One is Landon Collins, which Luke has correctly stated. He's probably going to get franchised. Another guy's Ha Ha Clinton Dix. We need a safety. And then at the defensive end spot, Demarcus Lawrence or Jadavion Clowney. Those guys are also franchise-type guys. 
that could be franchised. But if they don't get franchised, four players, two of those guys I would love to have in Indy. Out of the Chiefs, Steelers, Patriots, and Chargers, which team slash teams do the Colts have the best chance at beating in the playoffs? Great question. Phenomenal question. Um, To be honest, Jason, to be honest, out of those four teams, I hate to say it, but it actually might be the Patriots. I think we actually, this current Colts team, I actually kind of like the way we match up against them. The problem is when we played them, we were on a short week, we had to travel, we were coming off a 70-minute game, and we were decimated with injuries. I'm not saying that I want to go into Foxborough and play them, but I think we match up better than a lot of people. Like I think the Chiefs would be a tough matchup because of their offensive firepower. I think the Chargers would be a tough matchup because for some godforsaken reason, we could never beat them. The funny thing is, over the last couple of years, like in the Pagano era, the two teams we could never beat are the Steelers and Patriots. And out of these four teams, I think those are the two teams we actually probably match up a little bit better with. And all four games against all four teams would be on the road. So that's kind of a wash, the fact that we would have to go on the road and play them because all four yeah. games would be on the road. But most people would say you're crazy. But I think matchup-wise, the Patriots would actually probably be a team we match up the best with out of the four teams or maybe the Steelers. Yeah, I'm actually going to disagree with you here. I... I really don't want any part of Belichick in the playoffs. He's just so uh, such a good coach. I do think our, we match up better than we have in the past, and I do think it would be a closer game. It's hard for me to see us winning in Foxborough. My answer is probably going to shock a lot of people. I actually think the Colts match up best with the Chiefs. The Chiefs play no defense, none. And the Colts, while their defense isn't great by any stretch, they force turnovers. And the Chiefs are notorious for flaming out in the playoffs. They've done it since the 90s. I'm not really afraid of any of these teams, to be honest with you. If I had my choice, I honestly think the Colts could beat the Chiefs. I think they could beat the Steelers. I think the two teams I wouldn't want to play just because of past history, the Chargers. But then again, the Chargers on the road, that would probably be a home game for us. If we won the division, wild card scenario. No, 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 no. no. I mean, what I'm saying, what I'm saying is, the Chargers don't have any fans. Oh, oh like yeah, yeah. Every game, every game they play is a, is a road game, really. Yeah, if you yeah. ever watch them play in that little soccer stadium, every team they play, the Dolphins, the Bills, every team I've seen them play, I think that was last year when they played those teams, they've had the whole stadium. It's like 30,000. Uh, yeah, their people. revenue is it's way the, down right now. It's looking like a bust of a move. First of all, I didn't understand moving two teams to the same city at the same time. It made no right. sense. Like, why would you move two teams to the same city at the same time? That's proven it can't support football, by the That's way. That's proven it can't support football. That has – who's the closest geographically to them? The Raiders? Yeah, yeah. And the Raiders are going to move. And those Raider fans, if, they, if those Raider fans are going to pick one team or the other, are they going to pick the Chargers, who they freaking hate, or are they going to pick the Rams? They're going to pick the Rams. Right. So right. If, if they choose to pick one of those two teams, they're not going to pick the Chargers. They hate the Chargers. That was such a stupid move. Like, I did not understand that at all. Then you lose your fan base in San Diego. Well, half those people, at least half those people, probably more, are going to lose interest in you because that's just the way it happened. I mean, you could vouch for people in Baltimore how much they hate the Colts since the Colts left. Some, there's some people yeah. like you, and I'll go to Oreo games, and I'll meet Colt fans there. So, like, there are Colt fans in Baltimore, but a lot of people, even before the Ravens got there, they just resent yeah, the team for leaving them. It's just human yeah. nature. I mean, I, I know people in Jersey that hate the Nets for moving across the river to Brooklyn. And I'm like, are you, you hate the Nets because they moved to Brooklyn? Where it takes you the same amount of time to get into Brooklyn than it took you to get into Newark to see them at the Prudential Center? And they're like, yeah, well, it's just like a, like a city thing. Like, I'm a Jersey guy. I don't want to root for a Brooklyn team. And I'm like, all right, well, you know what? I'm not going to argue with you. I really don't care. I'm not a Net fan. I'm not a basketball. You know, I'm not. I'm an NBA fan. Like I like basketball, but I don't have an NBA team, so I'm not gonna, you know, sit here and argue with you over it. But people hate when their teams pick up and move. Their jobs leave the city. Like it makes a lot of sense why you would be upset when a franchise ups and leaves. And for them to go to Los Angeles, I thought it was really stupid. And their crowd attendance has been down. Revenue's been down. It's been a bust of a move going to Los Angeles. So you're right about that. The whole home field thing. It's not really home field if your fans don't show up. Arrowhead is crazy in the playoffs, even though they haven't won a playoff game in God knows how long. you got the Patriots yeah, just being the Patriots. The, the Chiefs are notorious for peaking in the regular season and then sputtering in the playoffs. The Colts, I think, are the type of team they don't want to play because we can keep up with their offense, I think. 
and, I, and our defense generally forces at least one or two turnovers a game. That would cost the Chiefs a game against us, I think. I don't think the Steelers are very good. They've won a lot of games barely. They haven't really blown anyone out. The Chargers, I think, are actually a really good team. I think that would be a tough game. And then New England, I mean, just going in the Foxborough in the playoffs is just – I mean, you're probably dealing with elements – I think that would be the toughest of the four just because of the guy you're dealing with, the quarterback and the offense you're dealing with, and then you throw the elements in there. So I wouldn't like our chances in it, probably any of those games, but as far as winning them. But if you're asking me who the best case scenario, who I think we would be able to compete with, I think they'd all be relatively close games. I just think the Chiefs would probably be the one team I think we can hang with. Yeah, most people are going to disagree with me. I just think that we match up best right now on paper against the Patriots. Gun to my head, would I pick the Patriots? Probably not, because I wouldn't want to bet. I wouldn't want the gun to my head to be against Belichick and Brady, and I would probably go with one of the other three teams. I would probably actually put the Patriots fourth on the list. But on paper, yeah. matchup wise, I actually think we match up pretty well against them in comparison no, I don't to disagree. years past. I don't disagree. I I I just it's the playoffs, January. Yeah, Belichick, Foxborough. It's hard. It's hard to say. Yeah, you. I feel good about that. You know what I mean? Yeah, Pittsburgh actually probably. I probably maybe I might go with Pittsburgh. The thing with Kansas City that scares me is just they could, oh, man. Because you're right, they don't play defense. And watch, we saw that Monday night against the Rams. They don't play any defense, and Mahomes is going to turn over the ball, and he's a little bit reckless but they got so much offensive firepower. I don't know. It's a good question, though. I mean, you could talk about this for yeah, it's four a fair, hours. Yeah, it's a, it's, that's, that is, that's the thing about our fans. They ask great questions, man. You could talk about them forever. Colts in the playoffs or not, the Chiefs will not be in the Super Bowl. There no. is no way that the Chiefs, are, The Chiefs and Rams yeah. both told me Monday night, as everybody was freaking out yeah. over that game, the Chiefs yeah, and Rams both told me neither Bowl. team's going to be in the Super Bowl. Right no, now I have the Saints don't. and then... In the AFC, I think it's very, very wide open. I could see a couple different teams coming. I, do, I don't see the Chargers coming out. I don't see the Chiefs coming out. I don't think Pitt, I don't think anybody's really that good in the AFC. That's what's so intriguing to me about 2019. Because 2000, I could see the Colts being AFC Super Bowl contending favorites I, in the AFC next year. Like I honestly believe that because I yeah, think we have the best quarterback. I, and I think next I year... We could be ready to take the AFC by storm, run right through. Brady's going to be 67 years old, and I think we could go right through the AFC next year, and I think we could be in the Super Bowl. I really, honestly, I, honest to God, do. I do, too. I, I've already moved up my time frame. from. I said we would compete in two years, or three years. So I've moved it up to two. I think next year, I think we're going to compete to be in the Super Bowl. Yeah, and when you say that, I don't think people are like, whoa, like that was a crazy bold prediction by Luke and Jason. I really think that that's going to kind of be, and you're already starting to see in the national media who I hate, yep. but you're already they're starting shifting. to see the shift yeah. because yep. they're like, damn, Andrew Luck is back. He's back, back. They got T.Y. They got Ebron playing at a high level. Frank Reich knows what he's doing. This defense is coming around. Darius Leonard's a monster. The offensive line is legit and elite. They're like, this team is coming. Andrew Luck yeah. had this team in the AFC Championship with nothing around him, with a horrible head coach, a horrible general manager, a horrible offensive line. It's scary to think what this kid could do when he starts to get the pieces around him. And now they're starting to kind of change their overall view on the Colts. And it's not just the yeah. people who've always been Luck fans like Colin Coward. It's all the people. Like They're all starting to say, hey, look at Indy. Indy's coming. Indy, uh, we were 3-5, and five, and they were starting to already say, this Colts team could get a wild card spot. The same people that said we were going to win two games all year. They're like, ah, oh, crap, I forgot. That Andrew Luck kid is really, really, really good when he's healthy. And now he's healthy. And he has an offensive line. And he has an offensive-minded head coach. And they have a cornerstone player on their defense who they're going to build the defense around in Darius Leonard who's going to win Defensive Rookie of the Year and is having an all-pro season as a rookie coming out of a FCS school in the second round. So definitely next year, man. I'm pumped, pumped, pumped for 2019. Yeah. And this question is good, I but it's also hypothetical. We might not run into any of those teams. We might not make the playoffs. Yeah. But in 2019, right. we are coming, and we're coming fast. We're coming hard. Absolutely. Do you think Evan Beam has done a good job when he's been in there this year? He hasn't played a lot, but I think he can be just fine until Kelly is back. Yeah, I think he's been okay. I mean, he, he's come in a couple times and played. I think he played in the Raider game when Kelly hurt his wrist or whatever, and he, and he played a little bit last week. So 
I think we're going to be okay there. I don't think it's going to be Ryan Kelly, but I also don't think it's going to. He's just going to be a sieve. So I think we're going to be fine. I don't think you're, I think he's going to be. He's going to be an average guy doing his job, doing the best he can, and I think we'll be fine. It's not just about him. It's about the guys around him, and they're all good. So I think we should be good. Does Clayton Gathers get re-signed after this year? If not, where do the Colts look to replace him? Well, Gathers is probably not going to be re-signed, but I think they're going to look at Collins, and if he gets franchised, I think they'll look at HaHa Clinton Dix. He's going to be a free agent, unrestricted, so he can sign anywhere. And so I would think they're going to look at those two guys and probably they'll look at the draft. I don't know what other safeties are out there, but I don't want like an old guy. They might look at re-signing Mike Mitchell, playing him at strong safety, and using that as a kind of a band-aid to get us to another year or whatever. I don't know. But I don't think they're going to keep gathers just because he's just too injury prone. So I would say look at Mike Mitchell first. Consider that option. They'll look at what's on the free agent market, what they are willing to spend, and then they'll look at the draft. Those are the three things I think you're going to see them look at. And as far as actual specific players, I really haven't done a lot of research into the safety market because I really haven't focused on that yet. I'm kind of just getting started on the draft. I'll get into that later. But those would be the three things I think, in order, the three things I think they'll look at. Why do so many quote-unquote football fans hate Andrew Luck so much? Andrew Luck does not deserve this kind of hate. Is it because they hate to see how good he is and they won't admit it? Or is it because they're just trying to make a name for themselves? Or is it both? I think it's both. And the reason why is I think it starts with one guy saying, Andrew Luck's overrated, and then it's just like a herd mentality. You know, they just want to do the end thing and bash the guy. And Andrew Luck is the type of guy that's not ever going to say anything bad about anybody, no matter what they say about him. They know they can say whatever they want about him. There's no consequences. No one's going to call him on it. Andrew Luck's not going to call him on it because he doesn't care. He doesn't care what these people think. People that think he's overrated are just idiots. You tell me Andrew Luck is overrated, and he tells me you don't know jack about football. Yeah, I think Andrew Luck's become one of the more underrated players in this league he's on a tear right now he's not top five in pro bowl voting which is a joke because the fans vote for their fan favorites fan bases that are bigger than the colts fan base have more people voting therefore their guys get into the top five but andrew luck's not a top five quarterback right now in the pro bowl voting which is a sin i mean that's an absolute sin andrew luck's having an incredible season he's having a top three seasons statistically. I mean, he's right up there statistically with Breeze and Mahomes and all those guys. He's second in touchdowns. He's up there top 10 in yards. I mean, he's having an incredible, incredible season. The difference is he was never supposed to play again. And everything is about fitting a narrative. In 2012, Skip Bayless came out and said, RG3 is going to be a better pro quarterback than Andrew Luck. And for the last seven, eight years, he has continued to try to fit that narrative. Since then, he's kind of dropped the RG3 thing, but he's still laser-focused on Andrew Luck. Let me talk down Andrew Luck in any way, shape, or form, however I could possibly do it. Let me talk him down. Let me fit the narrative. With the injury thing, let's fit the narrative. Andrew Luck hasn't thrown in 500 days. Andrew Luck's throwing a high school size football. Andrew Luck's never going to play again. Andrew Luck plays again. Oh, Andrew Luck doesn't have velocity. He's not very accurate. You could tell that the shoulder is not right. I mean, so on and so forth. Everything was about trying to fit the narrative. Steve Young came out and said, I had season tickets to Stanford. I was obsessed with Andrew Luck. And now his throwing motion is different. He's not the same quarterback. Steve Young came out and said that. I don't think I've heard Steve Young come out and talk about Andrew Luck since. But the problem with the national media is they put out so much content, stuff gets forgotten. Like people forget the dumb takes that a lot of these guys say because they figure, all right, 99% of the people are going to forget. But that one person that remembers will never be able to remind the other 99%. So it either gets lost in the shuffle or they continue to push the narrative. Like Skip Bayless continues to push the narrative. Other guys, just let it go. Let it go. Every week, Steve Young's on Monday Night Football. Every week, he's coming out with new content. Every week, he has new opinions. People will forget what he said about Andrew Luck in September. Skip Bayless is a different kind of media where he's like, all right, I'm going to keep driving home my point forever because that's how I'm going to make a name for myself so it's a little bit of both some people are just some people probably just don't want to admit how good he is Patriot fans probably just don't want to admit it 
Then you got guys like Skip Bayless who are trying to make a name for themselves. And then you got guys like Steve Young who kind of get wrapped up into what everybody else is saying. They come out with a statement. Then instead of retracting it, they're like, let me not admit that I was wrong because people won't remember I was wrong. And they kind of just let it fizzle out because they put out so much content. There's so much being said about them. The chances of the 1% that remember what Steve Young said about Andrew Luck will never be able to remind the other 99%. So the majority of the people that listen to Monday Night Football and watch Monday Night Football every week will not remember Steve Young's horrible hot take on Andrew Luck's throwing motion from September when we all said it's natural for a guy who hasn't played in an NFL game through 650 days to be a little bit rusty. So there's people who hate Andrew Luck because they're Jaguar fans or they're Texans fans or they're Patriot fans. Then there's other people like Skip who already have a name for themselves or people who want to be like Skip and are trying to make a name for themselves by putting out hot takes and driving home their point and fitting their narrative. And then there's people like Steve Young who come out, say something really, really dumb prematurely in September and just kind of forget about it and let it fizzle out because the masses won't remember what he said five, six, seven months ago as the months go by. So there's different ways to look at it. I think everybody that comes out with a hot take on Andrew Luck is a little bit different. But all in all, there's way too much hate about this kid. He's a perfect guy on and off the field. Jason, you bring up a good point like we talk about a lot. Andrew Luck's not going to come out and throw any of these guys under the bus. He's never going to come out and say a bad word about Skip Bayless. He's never going to turn his back on the media and say anything. Like, if you attack Aaron Rodgers, he's going to come out and say something. You attack Andrew Luck, he's not going to say anything. You attack LeBron James, he's going to say something. You attack Kawhi Leonard, he's not going to say anything. So the media knows which elite athletes they can target without the backlash from the athlete. And I think that's important, especially with, like, trade rumors. Mike and Mike came out last year on ESPN and said Oliver Luck, they started this rumor that Oliver Luck wanted Luck to be traded. Andrew Luck wanted to leave the Colts. Completely made up rumor. I mean, there was absolutely no truth to it, but it just gets lost in the shuffle. We don't even talk about it anymore. This is the first time I brought it up in 10 months. But... If we're not talking about it, who's talking about it? Nobody's talking about it. And it just kind of gets lost in the shuffle. And they know Luck's not going to come out and say anything about it because he's not that type of guy. When Popovich and Kawhi Leonard were having problems and rumors were starting about Kawhi Leonard, they knew he wasn't going to come out and say anything. But you start a rumor about LeBron James, you start a rumor about Steph Curry, you start a rumor about Draymond Green, he's going to come out and he's going to shoot it down. But... You start a rumor about Andrew Luck, he's not going to shoot it down because he's not that kind of guy. Aaron Rodgers is going to shoot it down. Luck's not going to shoot it down. They know the personality. And it's very rare for an elite athlete like Kawhi Leonard or like Andrew Luck to have that type of temperament. And they see that and they feast on it and they just attack it because they know how incredibly rare it is to have an athlete of that caliber be so timid, I would say, maybe, in the public eye. You look at right now in the MLB with some of these big names hitting the free agent market like Machado and Harper. These guys, you start a rumor about them, they're going to shoot it down if they don't like it. But Andrew Luck's not that kind of guy. No, and honestly with Luck, he just doesn't care. Like Andrew Luck just does not care what people – like he just doesn't care what anybody thinks except his teammates. That's the only – his coaching staff, his teammates, his organization, that's all that matters to him. He doesn't care – what gossip is out there. He's just not that guy. He could give two craps about any of that stuff. So that's why he just doesn't even talk about it. He just doesn't care. Are there any Colt fans out there rooting for a matchup with the Patriots on my end? I deserve this question after my answer from two questions ago. Are there any Colt fans out there rooting for a matchup with New England in January? Because I am. All right, well, this guy's... I don't know if I'm rooting for for a matchup with the Patriots, but this guy, I guess, sees what I saw in the other question. I think we have the better squad, and I know we have the better quarterback at this point. Completely different team than five weeks ago when we saw the Patriots for the first time on Thursday Night Football. Well, I admire the guy's confidence, and I do agree with him to a certain extent that we we match up much better with this Patriots team than we have in the past. I don't want to see that matchup until the AFC Championship, to be very, very honest with you, because Belichick, I mean, we talked about this earlier, Belichick, Brady... Foxborough, January, is probably the toughest place in the NFL and the toughest situation for a visiting team to be in. So do I want that? Well, yeah, if it means it's a chance to go to the Super Bowl, but do I want it like in the first round? Absolutely not. I, don't, like, I would 
like to avoid them this year if possible. I'm tired of having our seasons end at their hands. I would much rather play them next year when we're better and they're probably worse. So, look, I don't care. Like, if we get in the playoffs, I don't care who we play. If we get in the playoffs, it's house money. So, to an extent, I'm answering out both sides of my mouth because, honestly, if, we, if it means we're in the playoffs, then hell yeah, sign me up. You know, would I rather not make the playoffs and not play New England? Or make the playoffs and play New England. Well, sign me up for playing New England. But if I'm in the playoffs and you can give me a, a choice, I'm not going to choose them first for sure. So we'll play who we play. Do I think we can match up with them? Sure. Do I think we're going to win? No. I mean, I just don't think we're there yet. But we will be. We'll get there soon. But I just don't think we're quite there yet ready to beat them in Foxborough. You know who I want if we make the playoffs as a wild card? If we get that sixth spot in the playoffs? The Texans. Yep. Would love the Texans. Oh, man, that would be... Uh, yeah, we beat, I think we beat them on the road in the playoffs, too. I would take that. Last question. <laughs> when can I come on the show? We tried to do this, guys. We tried to do a live show before the season started, and we had three emails. Only three people yeah. were into it. Now, we've grown a lot since then. We're up to 2,200-something subscribers, so definitely more people out there now that probably want to come on the show. So... I would love to do a live show. We were going to do it over the bye week, the but bye week? Yeah, yeah, but then it got we got busy and we still put up like five videos I would say during the bye, so we did put out a lot of content. January would be a good time. January or February would be a good time. Like before like after the season but before the draft stuff, before the free agency stuff, I think would be a nice window. And if you guys are into it, I want to do it. But I want to do it with like yeah. a minimum of 25 callers. And that's not asking for a lot. At the time, like let's say we get up to 3,000 subscribers by January, February. We're asking for 25 people. Even right now, if we don't pick up a single subscriber from now until February, at 2,200 and whatever subscribers, we're only asking for like 20 to 25 callers. That would be a nice, lengthy show. That would be like this show right now. We did about 20 questions. That would be a nice show. 20 callers. That'd be nice. We'll go yeah, all day. I mean, I mean guys, I'll do five, I'll do five hours, but we need the cooperation from you guys. If you guys want to call, I'm all about it. I'm 100% on board. Yeah, yeah. and you guys got to remember, Luke, I mean, Luke is driving in and, and he's producing and all that stuff, so it's not like it's an easy thing for him. So the reason why we didn't do it before is three callers, you can't really make a show out of that. So what we're asking is, look, all you got to do is email us, Tell us you want to come on the show. If we get enough emails, we'll, we'll do it. I mean, it's as simple as that. And, and, and we know you guys are out there. It's just a matter of coordinating the time. I know most of you work, so you can't call during the day, and that's probably why. Yeah, that, was, that was my fault. The next time we do it, I'm going to set it up. We'll aim for maybe like 7, 8 o'clock at night, and we'll do it for a couple hours. The timing was my fault. My schedule is very weird, so... Earlier in the day, in the mid-afternoon, is a better time for me. But I understand if we want to appeal to the masses and we want to, you guys want to do it at seven, eight o'clock at night. I'll flex my schedule and we'll make sure we could set it up at nighttime so we could get as many people as possible on. And then the cooperation with the email thing is that's just so I could look at the screen, I could have everything programmed, and I could say, "We got Jason from Maryland on the line. Jason, what's going on?" Boom, yeah, they're on. If I just see a number pop up and it's a three one seven from Indianapolis, and I answer the phone, I'm like, hi, you're listening to the For the Culture podcast. Who do we have on the line? It's just, it's not as smooth. Like, I want it to sound like a real radio show, so I want everything pre-programmed. We don't have a screener screening the calls. When you call CBS 1430 or 1070 The Fan in Indianapolis, it's different because they have a screener. So you call up, they screen your call, they plug in the information, they tell the guy what you're talking I don't even care what you guys want you could call up you could blindside me with any question I don't care I don't need to be prepared we me and Jason don't even use notes on the show we just go off the top of our head we don't need any type of preparation if we can't answer the question we can't answer the question on those type of shows they feed them all the information they tell them what the topic is what the question is going to be beforehand who they are where they're calling from like everything is pre-programmed we're not going to have that all I want is your name and where you're calling from so I could say Hey, we have Bobby in Indianapolis. Bobby, what's going on? You're on the For the Culture podcast. Boom, like nice and simple, nice lead in. It's going to save us all a lot of time. It's going to give us more of an opportunity to get as many people as possible on the podcast. That's all I'm asking for. And if you guys just send the email with your name and your number and everything to the For the Culture email address, 
for the culture at gmail.com. We could program all that stuff. But we're going to talk more about that in the off season because we're not going to do that. I need a lot of time, you know, to do that and to get everybody on. So we're going to do that after the season, most likely in February, January. I think that'd be a good time. Or maybe like right after the Colts either get eliminated from playoff contention or get eliminated from the playoffs. We could do like an end of the season wrap up and that'd be good. Yeah, that's a good so, idea. Yeah, yeah so we'll, idea. yeah, we'll figure it out. We'll, we'll figure it out and we'll, we'll do something like that because I know a lot of people have been asking, but the problem is a lot of people asked beforehand. A lot of Before, people were asking, yeah, yeah. you know, all last year, they were like, can I come on? Can I come on? Can I come on? I said, yeah, we're going to do a live call-in show in August. And then we set it up and we had everything ready and we promoted it for three weeks and nobody wanted to come on. But maybe right. it was the timing. Maybe it was the fact that I set it up for like one o'clock or two o'clock in the afternoon. But we're going to do something for you guys to get your voices heard on the For the Culture podcast. You guys have been huge. We could not thank you any more than we already have. I mean, we thank you guys so much yeah, for all the support. Absolutely. I mean, you guys have been great. You guys got Reggie on the show, like we said, on the game recap. It was thanks to you guys. You guys were just hammering Reggie with mentions. My mentions were blowing up, and I was like, oh, my God, man. I mean, Reggie's going to see this. You guys really want him on the show. And then he ended up coming on the show. So you guys were huge in getting Reggie and luring him into the show. Couldn't thank you guys enough. Hope everybody has a great Thanksgiving. This video will probably be uploaded on Thanksgiving, so you're probably listening to it on Thanksgiving. So I hope everybody has a great Thanksgiving. Spend time with their family, watch some football, eat some good food. (laughs) 